Hi, my name's Paul Grogan, and in this Gaming Rules video, I'm going to be teaching you how to play Loot Island, designed by Aaron Hag and published by Watch Your Game. In the year 1640, a ghastly curse befell a beautiful island in the Indian Ocean. Because, well, it was a Tuesday, and ghastly curses don't have anything better to do. The dark magic would haunt whoever dared approach its coasts. Ingenious pirates soon realised that the island was the perfect location to hide their loot, and in order for them to recover their precious stashes in future, they drew maps and buried curse-cleansing amulets along with their treasures. The island, however, somehow used its evil powers and made pirates all over the world lose all of their maps. As a result, the treasures were lost forever. Well, almost. Centuries later, noble and handsome treasure hunters, yes you, enter the stage. You have come into possession of pieces of the ancient lost maps. However, you don't have a full map yourself, but you find out that the other treasure hunters also have pieces of maps. So you need to cooperate with them, piece the maps together to find the treasure. But at the same time, making sure that you get the biggest part of the loot for yourself. I'm going to be setting up a five player game. If you're playing with fewer than five players, then please refer to the rulebook for additional setup instructions. Place the main island board in the middle of the table. Each side of this island is a coast, and each coast has two landings represented by these circles. When setting up the rest of the game, make sure that you leave space around the main island as cards are going to be played there. Place the ship in any of the corners, facing a random direction. Sort out the treasure cards into four piles based on the Roman numerals on the backs. Depending on the number of players in the game, you will remove some of these decks. Shuffle each pile separately, and then place the three cards on top of the four cards, and then add the two cards, and finally the one cards. This forms the treasure deck. Shuffle all the map cards, and deal seven to each player. You should keep your map cards secret from the other players, because you don't want them to know what you might have planned. Place the rest of the map cards face down nearby. This is the map deck. Shuffle the healer cards, and randomly choose one of them for each player in the game. Without looking at them, place them in a face-down pile nearby, returning any extras to the box. Take the event cards and separate them into A and B. Shuffle the B cards and randomly choose four of them without looking at them, and place them face-down in the middle of the island. Shuffle the A cards and randomly choose one of them, placing it face-up on top of the other event cards. Place the remaining event cards back in the box, they will not be needed in this game. Lay out the small island tiles face up nearby. Only use this one in a five player game. Place the curse cubes in a supply on the table. Each player takes three compass markers and a character card in their chosen player colour. Place three curse cubes on your character card. And finally, choose a start player at random and give them the captain's first player tile. And now you're ready to start playing. The game is played over five rounds, and each round consists of three phases. In phase one, which is skipped in the first round, the ship moves to the next coast, a new event is revealed, and players receive new map cards. In phase two, players play map cards from their hand, either to the main island or to one of the smaller islands. In phase three, the coast where the ship is currently pointing to is explored. If there are enough cards on a landing, loot is found there distributed among the players who helped piece together the map. But beware, many of the treasures are cursed, meaning that you get these nasty black curse cubes. After the fifth round, a final exploration takes place, and then the game ends. You calculate the value of your loot by adding together the gold coins gained by your treasures, and then subtracting the cost that you must pay to the healer to remove your curses. And the player with the highest total loot value wins the game. Since phase one is skipped in round one, I'm going to begin by explaining phase two. Starting with the first player and proceeding clockwise, each player takes a turn, and this process repeats until all players have passed. On your turn, you have three choices. Visit a small island, play cards to the main island, or pass, which you must do if you cannot or do not want to play any other cards. The first player to pass get the first player tile and will be the first player in the next round. To visit a small island, you must discard two cards of the same colour from your hand. Then you choose one of the face-up small islands, 
perform the action of the island or not, and then flip the tile face down. So why on earth would you discard two cards only to flip a tile face down and not do the action? Well, let me try to explain. This small island moves the ship onto the next corner. I'll explain all of this in more detail later on, but basically in the next phase, the two landings next in the direction of the ship are explored. So if the ship is moved in the middle of the round, it means a different two landings will be explored instead. Let's say that you're the red player and you're really happy with where the ship is right now, because you are part of the group that will find treasure on both of these landings. But you're worried that the evil yellow player is going to visit the small island and move the ship here, which would be a lot better for them and terrible for you. So you could discard your two cards, visit the island yourself, but then just turn the tile face down without using the action. This at least stops somebody else using the island and can sometimes be the right thing to do. Treasure hunters can be pretty cutthroat at times. The actions of the small islands are all explained in the rulebook. Note that your map cards also have numbers and symbols on them, but when you're discarding them to visit a small island, only the colour matters. To play map cards to the main island, you must first choose any landing. Then you place one of your compass markers there, and then you can play one or more map cards of the same colour to that landing. Any colour card can be used to start a landing, but note that the two landings on one coast of the island must be different colours. So now that a landing has been started here with the brown cards, this landing can only be started with green, black or grey cards. And every further map card played on that landing must be the same colour as the previous ones and of a number equal to or higher than the previous card. So here I played a brown 2 and then a brown 4, which is all okay. Instead of starting a new landing, you can extend an existing landing, but the same rules apply. You must match the colour of the card and the next one must be a value equal to or higher. So another player could come along here, add a compass and then play a brown 7 for example. Now before I go any further, I'm going to explain briefly why it is that you want to be playing cards onto the main island. You see, in the next phase of the game, the two landings in the direction of the ship will be explored, but loot will only be found if there are enough cards there, which in a five player game is six cards. And if loot is found there, the players with compass markers will share out the treasures between them. If you play cards onto a landing where you already have a compass marker, you do not add a second compass. And if you want to play cards to a landing where you don't have a compass and all of your compass markers are on the board, then you must move one from another landing to the new landing. This means of course that removing your marker from a landing means that you're no longer eligible to take part in the loot finding that will go on at that landing. Now giving up on a landing is a difficult decision to make, but sometimes it's the right thing to do, especially if the new landing is more lucrative. Some cards have symbols on them. If you play a card to the main island with a symbol, the card's effect is applied. This symbol means that all players with compass markers on the landing, including you, may discard a curse cube. This symbol means that all players with compass markers on the landing may draw one card. Cards with a plus one on them count as one extra card for the purposes of determining if the landing has enough cards for loot to be found. The chest icons have no immediate effect, but they're important during phase three when they increase the amount of loot that is found at the landing. So you should definitely be careful when playing cards with chests on to make sure that you're the one that benefits the most. Cards with a number one are special and they can be played in two different ways. If it's the first card played to a landing or it's played on top of another one, then all other players must take one curse cube. If however, there are already cards on the landing with a value higher than one, you insert the card at the beginning of the column and then you can use the effect of a draw one card or discard one cube ability on a card that was already at the landing, if any, but only you get the effect. In this case, you and only you get to draw a card. Cards with a star are wild cards. They can always be played on a landing if the color matches. They replicate the same value as the previous card or count as a one if they are the first card played. However, they only match the value of the card, they don't replicate its ability. A quick note on playing cards. You need to be really careful when starting a landing that you don't start by playing cards of a high value because there needs to be a certain number of cards there for loot to be found and every card played on the landing must be equal to or higher than the previous card. 
So if you start a landing by playing a 9 and a 10, it's very unlikely that that landing will ever get completed. After all players have passed, the game proceeds to phase 3. Both of the landings on the coast that the ship is pointing to are explored one at a time. For loot to be found at a landing, it must contain a minimum number of cards, which in a 5 player game is 6 cards. Cards on the landing with a plus 1 symbol count as 2 cards for this purpose. So in a 5 player game, this landing has enough cards as although there are only 5 of them, one of them has a plus 1 on it. If neither landing has enough cards, you can skip this part and proceed to clean up. And then you can start blaming each other about whose fault it was that no treasure was found. If at least one landing has enough cards, then the landing with the most cards is the big loot landing. If both landings have the same number of cards, then the one nearest the ship is the one with the big loot. For the big loot landing, you reveal treasure cards equal to the number of compass markers on the landing, plus an extra one for each treasure chest symbol on the map cards. So in this case, there are six treasures. So six treasure cards are revealed from the top of the deck. Then, starting with the player whose compass marker is on the bottom of the stack and proceeding upwards, each player chooses a treasure card, taking it and placing it in front of them. And this process repeats until all treasure cards have been taken. So back to our example, blue takes first, then yellow, then white, then red, and then back to blue and then yellow, a white and red aside, as they only got one treasure each. Then the other landing is explored, as long as there are enough cards. This is the small loot landing, and it's explored in the same way, except you only reveal treasures based on the number of treasure chest icons and not the number of compass markers. For example, in this case, there are only two treasures, so yellow will miss out. When you take a treasure, you actually have two choices. You can either keep it, and if it shows a number of curses in the top right, you take that number of curse cubes. Or, if it has this icon, you can return that number of curse cubes. The treasures are all worth something at the end of the game, and they're all fully described in the rulebook. Your other option is to leave the treasure on the island, burying it in the sand. Doing this allows you to remove two of your curses, plus one extra curse for each amulet that you currently have. So here, if I get this bag of gold, I could choose to leave it on the island, and I would discard three curse cubes because I have one amulet. You must make the decision immediately upon taking the treasure whether you want to keep it or leave it on the island. And this can sometimes be a difficult decision to make. Do you take the treasure and gain the curses that come with it, or do you bury it on the island and remove some of your curses? Now, don't be afraid of gaining curses during the game, as long as the treasure that you take is worth it for you. However, you do want to try to end the game with fewer curses than the other players. I'll explain this more later on. After both landings have been explored, proceed to clean up. All the compass markers on both landings of the exploration coast, regardless of whether any loot was found there or not, are returned to the players, and all map cards on those landings are placed on the discard pile. And this is the really important thing. The cards and the markers on both of those landings that were explored are removed even if there wasn't enough cards for loot to be found there. So let's say that you and another player play five cards here to try and find treasure. And in a five player game, six cards are needed when this coast is explored. So your map is incomplete and you end up wandering around the jungle aimlessly. You get your compass markers back and the cards are discarded and you get nothing. Compass markers and cards on the other landings remain there for future rounds. I mentioned earlier on that phase 1 is skipped in the first round of the game, but in later rounds this is the first phase that you do at the start of each round, so I'm going to explain it now. First, move the ship to the next corner of the map in the direction that it's facing. Second, any small islands that had been flipped over are now flipped back. And third, the event card on top of the stack is discarded and the next one is flipped face up. And finally, each player may discard any number of cards from their hand and then draw replacements, bringing their total back to a hand of 7 cards. If the map deck is ever empty, shuffle the discard pile to make a new deck. At the start of the game an event was revealed on top of the stack. This is an entry in the ship's logbook and it has an impact on the game for this round. The rulebook explains in detail what each of these events does, and at the start of each round after the first, the current event is discarded and a new one revealed. These events might cause you to rethink your current plans, 
or even present new opportunities for you to take during the round. This one, for example, means that each player can only have two compass markers on the main island, which really changes things up. After the fifth round, all remaining landings on all coasts are explored. For each landing, if there are enough map cards there, distribute loot as if it was a small landing. And then check each player's curse cubes. Any player with 13 or more is immediately eliminated from the game, so don't let this happen to you. Next, reveal the healer cards that were chosen at the start of the game. Starting with the player with the fewest curses and progressing in increasing order of number of curse cubes, each player chooses a healer card and takes it. Each player then calculates the value of their loot, using the player aid for reference. The full rules for this are found on page 13 of the rulebook, and the different treasures score in a variety of different ways. And you add 5 gold coins if you end the game with the captain tile. Each player must then pay the healer to remove their remaining curses. This is determined by the healer card that you took. This one, for example, has a cost of 4, plus 1 per curse cube. And this one has a fixed cost of 12, no matter how many curses you have. If you cannot pay to remove all of your curse cubes, then you are eliminated from the game. Of all of the non-eliminated players, the player with the highest total loot value wins the game. And if all players have been eliminated, then nobody wins. And maybe you should try hunting mushrooms next time instead of treasure. I hope you found this video useful in learning how to play Loot Island. For more of my videos, please consider subscribing to my channel. And for more great games from Watch Your Game, please visit the Watch Your Game website. Until next time, take care and thanks for watching.